Ten months ago, a political newcomer was elected to the Michigan House of Representatives, not because he had any childhood dreams of being a politician or because he really loved the spotlight or because he wanted power of any sort, actually. He just had some ideas about how to make things better in his community from experience working in the community, plus a master's degree in public policy and a law degree. The voters agreed that his ideas were the best. They sent him off to the government to make those ideas happen. And that pretty much is when theory and practice started to diverge. Alex Bloomberg spent three days with freshman state representative Steve Tabachman. Here are all the reasons Steve Tabachman shouldn't be in office. His district is 80% minority, but he's white. At the time of his campaign, he didn't have any actual experience in politics, and he was up against a two-term incumbent. And he ran in the most old-fashioned way possible. No radio or TV ads, no special interest money. He went out and knocked on doors every single day for four months. And you'd spend so many hours knocking. I mean, you, uh, your knuckles would be raw, your, your knees would hurt, your hips would hurt. Uh, it's a tremendous weight loss program. <laughs> I, I actually, to maximize, and this is a little embarrassing, but to maximize the number of doors I could knock on, I would run. I would literally sprint between the houses uh, to, to save time. I literally would sprint between houses. So I, I, one day I was sprinting down the street, and uh, this, I, I, I kind of jogged into this guy's backyard, and he's like, are you okay, are you okay? And I said, what? What do you mean? And he said, well, I see a white guy running in this neighborhood. I figured somebody was under attack or something like that. Steve's district is a poor inner city section of Detroit, a city whose problems are legendary, of course. It has the nation's highest infant mortality rate. It's lost half its population since 1950. And to give you an idea of the size of its middle class, the total number of Starbucks in this, the 10th largest city in the country, three. 13 fewer than at O'Hare Airport. Steve had been trying to fix Detroit's problems for years, in various jobs with various neighborhood economic development groups. Mostly, he fought slow, bureaucratic battles to get abandoned buildings either torn down or fixed up. He can tell you all sorts of modest, specific ways that government could help improve things, by streamlining the way federal block grants are distributed, for example, or selling condemned properties to community and church groups for a dollar for the groups to rehab and sell at a discount to low-income families. But these ideas usually went nowhere. I mean, Steve will come home for years and be frustrated, you know, like you're working and you're working and you're working and it seems like a good idea and you can't get anything done about it. This is Steve's wife, Sharon. She says that all this changed during a dinner Steve had with a mentor of his from grad school. Basically, he said, stop complaining and do more. You know, like if you're, if you're, what's making it hard are our level of politicians or a level of bureaucracy, then get inside that bureaucracy and change that bureaucracy. And he came home and said, I think I need to run for office. What do you think about that? <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I always thought, oh, you run for office, and that's really you know, about ego, and it's very self-serving. And uh, somehow that, that conversation was different because this was a view that spoke to me in terms of making a difference. So, so, so in other words, it sort of it, it made you think that like you could actually, by, by becoming a politician, you could actually do some, some good. That, that was the thought. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what I, every day, you know, you, you, you try and see if that's indeed the case. So, did you see the paper today? No. If you've ever wondered what the hell politicians do all day, I can say that if Steve Tabachman's any indication, a lot more than you do, pal. His workday begins at 7 or 8 a.m., and this one includes, among other things, a very dull hour-plus tour of a social service facility, a 15-minute phone call with an Arab-American constituent who believes her teenage son is being discriminated against in school, at the end of which Steve promises to call the principal. And what, and what, would, you, what would be a, a, a solution in your mind to the problem? There's a lunch meeting with a business constituent who wants a favor, a staff meeting, some fundraising calls, and then in the evening, a two-hour town meeting in a high school gymnasium on the subject of insurance redlining. I just tried to buy a brand new car. An angry crowd of 20 to 30 Detroit home and car owners complains about insurance rates that are almost 50 percent higher than rates right across the border in the suburbs. The lowest I could get per month for insurance was $365 a month. The insurance would have been more than my car now. Steve and offers said, some suggestions, and one middle-aged Hispanic man in a black satin varsity jacket and a baseball hat grabs Steve by the arm and says, We've never heard anyone talk so clearly about this before. You are the one who can help us. You are the light, and we will follow you. You are the, you are the light, and we, we follow you. Steve gets home at about 10 p.m. You are the light to me because I feel frustration every single time. 
And now, it's 7 a.m. the next morning, and though it's still dark outside, the light is up and driving to Lansing, the state capital, in his blue Saturn station wagon, where at least in theory, he'll be helping the people he met last night. The problem, of course, is that Steve works with 110 other representatives, and they're all driving up from their own town meetings, where their own constituents have been demanding action on their own quite different grievances. Getting elected might give you a slightly louder voice, but it also sticks you into a much noisier crowd, the majority of whom couldn't care less about redlining, or community development, or frankly, the entire city of Detroit. And you don't care about their issues either. In fact, being a legislator involves spending a lot of time dealing with issues you have absolutely no interest in. Sometimes, though, the issues you care least about can end up altering the course of your political career. Issues with names like the Michigan-controlled share owner statute. In the car on the way to Lansing, Steve tells me the story. I didn't know about it, and most people didn't know about it. Um, it basically was adopted in the mid-'80s uh, to prevent hostile takeovers of Michigan companies, companies based in Michigan. And, now, uh, as a legislator, facing a bill you don't care that much about, you have two choices. You can A, assume someone in your party has looked at the issue thoroughly and vote how that person tells you to. Or B, you can do all the research yourself and come to an independent position based entirely on your own principles and convictions. No one does B. Well, except for freshman legislators. When I, when I first got to the legislature, I think every vote uh, I used to sit at my desk on the floor, and as every issue came up, you know, you have a, I would study it and get as much information as possible uh, before casting my vote. Do you think that, like, of the bills that, that, that sort of people vote on, do you think that people have, a, most of the people who are voting for the bill actually understand how it will impact once it's implemented? Um, I think that you have a general gist of what the bill is trying to do, but in terms of understanding the specifics and and that kind of thing, and being able to articulate a detailed analysis, I think that, um, you know, it's virtually impossible. So just a month or two into his new job, Steve found himself reading up on the Michigan-controlled share owner statute, which had come before the legislature at the urging of the Taubman Group, a private mall development company based in Michigan and owned by the Taubman family. They were trying to fight off a takeover by an even bigger mall development company called the Simon Group, and they needed a loophole closed in the law to do that. After a couple of late nights of research, Steve decided that the Tommans were right, and he agreed to co-sponsor a bill fixing the loophole. And that's when all hell broke loose. There were probably $2 billion at stake. The Tommans and the Simon Group had each hired their own army of lobbyists. All of a sudden, there were 100 or 200 people at committee meetings, where usually there were only 20 or 30. Everyone took sides, business groups, unions, and of course, Steve's own party. The Democratic leadership approached him one day and told him, to his horror, that he was the only Democrat who'd agreed to support the bill. Not only that, the Democrats were planning to run TV ads attacking the Taubman supporters as tools of big business. And then came a pivotal caucus meeting, a closed-door strategy session where the whole party discusses upcoming policies and positions. There's one point in caucus where about five or six people have just blasted this bill uh, and talked about, you know, that this is, uh, you know, just, and then all, and used all the sort of, uh, uh, hyperbolic uh, arguments that, um, you know, that, that, that everybody had used against this bill, that, you know, the Taubman family had given hundreds of thousands of dollars to Republicans, and why should we be doing their business in, in the legislature? And this was, you know, based solely on campaign contributions. And I'm sitting there as a freshman thinking, man, do I look bad right now? <laughs> and am I going to, I'm going to look even worse when there's one Democratic vote on the floor. I mean, boy, this is going to be embarrassing. <laughs> So basically, finally, I'm about the seventh speaker. And at that point, probably more out of fear than anything else, uh, I get up and begin to talk about uh, the bill. Steve's colleagues still mention that speech to him. It was the speech of his young political career. He talked about what the bill would do to protect Michigan businesses and workers. He talked about jobs. He talked about CompuWare, the big company owned by Peter Carmanos, that had just built a huge high-rise in downtown Detroit. I got very passionate, and I started talking about Mr. Carmanos' investment in CompuWare and revitalizing the city of Detroit, and should Microsoft come and take over CompuWare, that we knew those jobs were going to leave, and uh, downtown Detroit would be you know, vacant, and uh, all these horrible things would happen. And uh, the tone of my voice rose, the passion of my voice rose, and we went out onto the floor, and had the vote, and 22 of my 47 colleagues ended up voting with me, and um, as a result, it overwhelmingly passed the House, and, uh, and then because of that kind of support, it passed through on the Senate, and last week, the governor 
uh, signed the bill into law. And, uh, it, it, you know, when I think about what caused that much emotion, um, I, I certainly don't think it was uh, the Michigan controlled shares statute. I think it was uh, more the fear of, uh, uh, of being, uh, being the lone vote for the, the horrible Taubman bill. <laughs> The Taubman bill earned Steve a reputation as something of a rainmaker on the other side of the aisle. And the Republicans who were in charge of getting the bill signed into law were so grateful, they've actually helped Steve move some of his own legislation. But what's funny is that this vote, a vote that enhanced his political standing in his own party, gained him valuable allies on the other side of the aisle, not to mention brought about a positive change in the law, is a vote that he wouldn't have cast today. Steve no longer studies every bill that crosses his desk. He uses his time talking to colleagues and listing support for his own issues. If the Taubman bill came before him today, he would have listened to his party, not learned anything about it, and voted against it. I'd be happy to have you along and we split it up. House will come to order. I'd ask all members to take their seats. On the huge floor of the Michigan House of Representatives, nobody is coming to order. The 110 lawmakers, 63 Republicans and 47 Democrats, continue to mill around and cluster in small groups. There's a big fight brewing today over two bills, Senate Bill 252 and Senate Bill 560, both of which do essentially the same thing, which is impose fees on anyone who discharges pollution into the water. One of the bills deals with groundwater, the other rivers and lakes. In any event, in both of them, the more pollution you discharge, the higher your fee. For small organizations like a day camp with a septic system or a small veterinary office, the fees are in the hundreds of dollars. For large entities like the Ford Motor Company or the city of Grand Rapids, they can climb into the tens of thousands of dollars. The idea is that the bills will encourage everyone to pollute less because that will lower your fees and thus lead to clean drinking water for everyone. Nearly every state has fees like these. Michigan is one of just eight states that don't. Okay, one other thing you should know. Today's fee bills were the idea of Michigan's Democratic governor, and earlier in the year, she'd worked out a deal with the Republicans, who control both the House and the Senate in Michigan, by fairly large majorities. Each party had agreed to put up a certain number of votes to pass the bill. And as of last week, the bills had come out of committee, and everything seemed to be going smoothly. Today, though, it seems that the deal might have fallen apart, and that Senate Bill 252 and Senate Bill 560 are in trouble. Steve points to the computer terminal at his desk. As you can see from the legislative schedule, there are... Ten amendments right now uh, in the docket for 252. Thirteen amendments for Senate Bill 560 uh, that, that are being planned, and uh, probably an equal number from each party. And that's a lot? That's a lot. Generally speaking, all the Republican amendments do the same basic thing. They exempt certain groups from having to pay the pollution discharge fees. Chair recognized Representative Droulette. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative well, Leandro Lett, a Republican from the Detroit suburbs, sure that, gets up and makes the case. He says the pollution discharge fees are excessive and, and they've been foisted on his constituents and, uh, by the Democratic governor. Year. I'd like to review some of who these polluters are that we're making pay and what the governor is proposing her executive fees. For one of the polluters, the uh, Sable Valley Nursing Home, the governor proposed a $6,000 fee on them. Big polluters like the KPAC Fellowship Christian Church we we'll have to pay $4,000 additionally under this, pro under this proposal. The Boy Scouts of America would have to pay $2,500 in new fees and redo their... The program. line between political Chief pandering and political Scouts belief is a hazy one. As I watch Representative Drillette, it seems his opposition is sincere. People tell me he's a principled and committed libertarian. If Steve sees himself as fighting on behalf of people who just want clean drinking water, Representative Drillette sees himself as fighting on behalf of people who are just trying to make an honest buck without interference from the state. Both men think that if things ran their way, the world would be a lot better. And both men think that if things ran the other guy's way, the world would go to hell in a handbasket. Watching Representative Drillette, I realize, sometimes democracy is not about getting your way. It's about making sure the other guy doesn't get his. It's the governor who's proposed these fees. It's the governor that made a deal to put them through the legislature. It's the governor that wants to charge Gene Ringley of Clean Jeans Laundry Mat $2,000 additional dollars a year. So let's let Gene Ringley Jr., of Roscommon, Michigan, know who but wants him to cough up the two grand. Speeches like Drillette's make the Democrats on the other side of the aisle nervous, especially ones like Representative Jennifer Elkins, whose district is heavily Republican. She doesn't want Gene Ringley of Clean Jeans Laundromat to think that she's taking two grand of his hard-earned money. 
and she sees that the Republicans are setting a political trap for her. Each of their amendments exempts some group of Michigan voters from this new government fee. If the Democrats oppose the amendments, the Republicans will use that against them in re-election time. She pulls Steve aside. We're going to get hung on this shit. When the Republicans were meeting, our names were brought up in that exemption. She tells Steve she overheard the Republicans mentioning her name specifically as someone to target. But Steve tells her not to worry. The Democrats met earlier and agreed there's no point falling into this trap the Republicans are setting. They won't challenge the Republicans on any of this. In other words, they're voting for all the exemptions. For the exemptions, we're all voting for the exemptions. They don't understand that that's what we're doing. Yeah. They think we're going to fight them on all these little nonprofits and churches. That's right. That's bull- we're not going to take that heat. You guys should vote for every. Way, you should I mean, vote for every they, exemption. They just... All those in favor of the amendment will vote aye. All those opposed, nay. The clerk will open the board. On a big light display board at the front of the chamber, member names light up as they press their vote buttons. Red means no. Green means yes. Steve is the floor manager for the Democrats today, meaning it's his job to make sure everyone else knows how to vote. Recommending Green. What do you mean? Why should we let them say, oh, we protected you and we didn't? That's bull****. They're all going to pass. You might as well be on there. Why should we let them vote for this? And we have to take the heat on this. Green. <laughs> what? All members voted. Clerk will close the board. Tally display and announce the vote. Mr. Speaker, on the question of adoption of the Brad Street Amendment 2D, there are 102 aye votes and three nay votes. The majority of the members elected and serving have voted in support of the Brad Street Amendment 2D is adopted. There are further amendments. Quick read. The debate about the fee bills drags on long after this, for four hours until 6 p.m., well past the time the session usually ends. One of the bills ends up passing, but the other one keeps getting slammed around. Republicans continue to introduce amendments exempting various sympathetic institutions, farmers, schools, small towns, and they continue to pass with majority Democratic support. And then the Democrats turn around and introduce amendments that directly contradict the ones they just voted yes to, tightening regulations and increasing fees. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment to increase fees for chronic violators of the Clean Water Act serves two important purposes. These fail entirely along party lines. There's a highly choreographed feel to the whole thing. People don't cheer and high-five when their amendments pass, and they don't slam their briefcases on their desks when they fail. They're not trying to persuade each other, or even to win. Each vote, each amendment, each speech for the record is solely about targeting the other party's positions at election time. The Republicans are trying to catch the Democrats raising taxes on the Boy Scouts. And the Democrats are trying to get the Republicans on record voting against clean drinking water. But not everything in the day goes according to script. There's exactly one time in the entire debate when someone introduces an amendment as a matter of personal conviction and not as a matter of party strategy. A Republican representative, Jack Brandenburg, introduces an amendment that mandates surprise on-site inspections at companies that pollute. In other words, that actually strengthens the environmental provisions of the bill. And he does it for the simple reason that he's worried about all the bad stuff going into the water. Currently, there are 600 toxins that, have dis- that, have, that if not discharged properly, are, harm- are harmful to the health of human beings. Some of the most com- commonly discharged toxins are the following. Mercury, linked to Im- immune disorders and brain damage. Barium. Brandenburg talks for a long time, before Steve and the Democrats even realize it's not the usual offering from the other side of the aisle. We should, we should all be voting for this. The Republicans are realizing the same thing, and you can hear the murmuring increase as people try to figure out what's going on. Copper is the most frequently discharged toxin into the Great Lakes, but we, do not yet, we have not yet determined if this is any way ineffective on our health. A little respect here, please. Mr. Speaker. You may proceed, Representative. All right. Brandenburg finishes. The clerk opens the board. And much more slowly than on any of the other votes, names begin to appear, one after another, many of them green, Republicans voting for a fellow Republican. The clerk closes the board, and it looks like the measure has actually passed. But then, the clerk doesn't tally the results, sits quietly, watches the Republican floor leader, who's talking heatedly into the phone at his desk. Other Republican leaders circulate around their colleagues, and gradually, Thanks. green names start switching to red. Representative Middaw votes nay. Representative Palzerock votes nay. At one point, I witnessed a classic backroom political horse trade done right out in the open, in the most blatant way possible, in the middle of the chamber floor. Virgil Smith, a Democrat from Detroit, 
sees which way the wind is blowing, sees that the Republican floor leader isn't going to close the board until he gets enough no votes from his own party to kill the amendment. And so, Representative Smith decides to help them and help himself. He gets up, walks across the floor, with his arm held above his head and his thumb pointed straight up in the air, as if he were raising his hand in school and giving the thumbs up sign at the same time. He walks right up to the Republican floor leader, Randy Richardville, who's huddled on the phone, surrounded by his advisors. And he stands there, with his thumb in the air. Richardville puts down the phone, looks up at him. They have a brief conversation. And then, Representative Smith walks back to his seat, still with his arm in the air, but this time, with his thumb pointed down. Whatever happened, he's now voting nay. Representative Smith votes nay. He voted nay? <laughs> what did you get for that, Virgil? We got something. He got something. He got something for that. They didn't want this to pass. And it doesn't pass. After a brief digression from the day's script, Republican leaders continue turning green votes to red until they have what they need. Tell I display an announce the vote. Mr. Speaker, on the question of adoption of the Brandenburg Amendment 2D, there are 51 I votes and 52 nay votes. Sufficient number of members having not voted in the affirmative, the Brandenburg Amendment 2D is not adopted. There are further amendments. There are the further Representative Coochie offers one amendment and The weirdest maneuver of the day, though, comes at the very end. After spending all day adding amendment after amendment, the Republicans introduce one final amendment. It comes at the very end, and it's rushed through on a procedural maneuver without a record vote. Steve and all the Democrats scramble around to try and figure out what it says. So what did, so what did they do here? What did they just do? And even the press guy for the Republican Party is caught off guard has to head out to the floor, find out what it does. He comes back and tells us with a sheepish smile. Basically, it takes us back in time three hours. It returns Senate Bill 560 to its original language, stripping off every amendment the Republicans had added, undoing everything the Republicans had spent the past three hours doing. Then, the Republicans bring this new bill, which is not the same as the old bill, to a vote, and it fails. And then, the Republican majority leader, Rick Johnson, holds a press conference in which he blames the Democrats, the minority party, and the only ones who actually voted for the bill, for its failure. In the process, they made Steve DeBachman waste half his day on a huge turkey shoot that helped no one in his district. On the car ride home, we discussed the day. It wasn't all bad. He did manage to get some minor amendment, something to do with fraudulent notary republics, through a committee earlier in the day. Tells me that so far, the best moment of his political career was the first, election night. It was early in the evening, and the returns were still coming in. He was standing in front of all his supporters, and for the first time, he thought to himself, it doesn't matter whether I win or lose. I ran a great campaign. I took no money. I spoke about issues that I believed in. I did everything exactly according to my beliefs. Driving home tonight, after a long, confusing day at his new job, as the rain pours symbolically down from the sky, that night feels very far away. Do, do you find it like yesterday we drive around your district, and then we go to this like redlining meeting where you've got a lot of, you know, it's very local, um, and then I come into that chamber, and then there's this there's this like elaborate political game that's going on. It, it's hard to see the connection sometimes. It was hard for me. Is it sometimes hard for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, today's. Um, activity was a bunch of pageantry and it really does not, in my mind, impact the quality of life too greatly and, I, 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 and I, that I ask myself all the time and that I've continually asked myself and you know you might go out there and you find yourself advocating for the Taubman bill or for pollution discharge permit fees or maybe you don't have, you can't really produce the results to end insurance redlining that you want to produce and you feel, wow, I'm a total fraud up here. Here I am talking about, you know, something I truly honestly believe in, and I'm doing everything I can, but at the end of the day, you know, what kind of impact am I having? And uh, is there a different thing I should be doing with my life? And, um, you know, is, is all of this worth that, that kind of trouble? In Steve's freezer at home in Detroit, there's a two-foot-long pork loin. It's been there for 10 months. It was a Christmas present sent to him by some lobbying group right after he got elected. Steve's not sure who sent it to him or what it's supposed to get him to do, let alone why anyone thought sending a huge piece of non-kosher meat to a Jew before Christmas would help with anything, 
or for that matter, why they ignored the obvious negative symbolism of sending pork to a politician. In the end, so much of politics is about hope. Somewhere, there's a guy at some pork council putting mailing labels on boxes of meat thinking, maybe this will help. And for Steve, making a connection between what he does on a daily basis and what he actually wants to do requires a similar leap of faith. That the compromises he makes now will reward him later. And that somewhere down the line, performances like the one today in Lansing will do some good for someone back in Detroit. Alex Blumberg.